Okay, so this one shows that if you read it, it says a table shows sample cells taken from tissues of two individuals of the same species. So there's two key points here, two individuals. So you'd expect automatically, because we're talking about DNA, I'm automatically expecting that there's going to be two different sets of DNA. I don't know yet because I haven't read the question, but then it says the same species. So I'm thinking they're going to have be similar. They're going to have the same genes, just different alleles. And from each cell is analyzed using a gel electrophoresis. Now, uh, we didn't really talk too much about gel electrophoresis. I don't think it's it's really that important. But bottom line, uh, for you at this at this stage, but what it is is you're going to see you're going to be able to take DNA, break it up in various ways, and you're going to be able to get different patterns based on the the different alleles, the different sets of genes uh, and different alleles that you might have. And that's what electrophoresis is. is it's separating uh, the DNA and looking at the comparison of the DNA. So it's a way to compare DNA by size of the DNA uh, pieces. And it says... Tissue source from individual A, again, there's two individuals from the same species, from liver to liver, A is liver and liver, lung, here, here it says uh, tissue source individual A, lung and skin, muscle and muscle and blood and pancreas. So again, remembering that when we look at two individuals, right, from the, uh, from the same species, we'd expect that the genes are going to be the same in the liver, the same genes will be turned on in the liver, for both individuals, there'll be different genes turned on in, in these two individuals. They'll have the same genes, different alleles, but obviously in the skin, it's going to have a certain set of genes turned on that are not turned on in the lung, and a certain set of genes are turned on in the lung, they're not turned on in the skin. So there's that idea that even though you have the same DNA in all your cells, different cells have different genes turned on and others turned off. So let's go on and see what the question is. So the question here is, let me go ahead and paste the actual, oops, why is that doing that? I don't know. All right, let's go paste this here so we have it for our comparison and focus on the question. It says, which prediction would be supported by the results of the gel electrophoresis analysis? All right, so if we if we broke these this DNA and we analyze the DNA and we compare the DNA between two individuals of the same species with the same tissues, different tissues, same tissue, different tissues. These are different tissues, so they'll have different genes turned on and others off. These will have the same genes turned on, but they'll be different alleles. So now let's go ahead and read. Cell 1 from individual A will have an identical banding pattern compared to cell 1 from individual B. Cell 1 will have identical banding patterns. Again, the DN, the, they're going in the same tissue. They're going to, the banding pattern is going to be broken up. Their DNA will be broken up. You're going to look for, for different genes being turned on. Uh, Let's look at cell one from J will have an identical banding pattern to hold on a second. So again, when we're looking at this electro gel electrophoresis, it's gonna compare the DNA, right? And so again, electrophoresis looks like this almost like they call it in fact a comb that sits in there. Looks like a comb, and it picks up lanes. And in these lanes, the DNA is split into genes. The genes are split. So different alleles will have different sizes. Maybe the alleles from one individual will have uh, be bigger in one, and some other genes might be some other pieces of DNA might be smaller, and it'll be broken up more often because the sequence is going to be different. So this might be individual one, and this is individual two. So between individual one and between individual one and two, this the sequences of DNA are going to be different because they have different alleles. They have different alleles. So because they have different alleles,
they the banding pattern is going to be different between them. So this pattern is going to be different between them. They have different DNA. They're individ they're different have different alleles. So A will have one set of patterns and B will have another set of patterns, whatever those that whatever that pattern is, because they're two different individuals. Even though they're the same species, they have the same genes, their alleles are going to be different. On the other hand, if you have a liver, if you have the same individual, so if you look at this chart carefully, this is individual A, all these samples are from individual A. So in the liver, lung, muscle, and blood, they have not only the same genes, but also the same alleles. So if you broke that DNA up, yes, there's this liver in individual A will have a different set of genes turned on than in the lung, but the DNA is going to be the same. So a different set of genes are turned on and off, but the DNA is the same. So everything in this individual, you have to be careful how you read the chart, has the same DNA. Therefore, even if you, when you run an electrophoresis, we'll have the same pattern. This one, everything in this lane, in this column, is going to have the same DNA. And let me use a different color so that you can see. Why? Because it's from the same person. Just different genes are turned on and off. They have the same DNA, they have the same genes, but they also have the same alleles. Here, these two have the same genes, but different alleles, right? Different forms. And because of that, the banding patterns are going to be different between the two individuals, even if they have the same, even if they're both from human liver, this person's DNA is going to be different from this person's DNA. So you got to think about shows like CSI and other forensic shows where they take the DNA of one individual and compare it to another. They can take skin cells from one individual and, and another and, and compare their DNA and they'll they'll see a difference in the pattern. And so think about CSI when you're doing these things. This is how we can tell when one person, one person's DNA from another's. They show different patterns when we run them on these gel electrophoresis uh, experiments or lab results. So cell one from individual A have identical banding patterns to cell one from individual B. You would think initially, yeah, because they're both from liver, but they're not because they have different alleles. So no, they're not going to have the same banding patterns. They're going to be different. So this is not an answer. Again, remembering that DNA from the same person will have the same banding patterns, but not DNA from a different person. Cell 1 from individual A will have identical banding pattern as compared to cell 2 from individual A. So DNA in the lung and DNA in the liver are the same. That's correct. Why? Because they are the same person. They're all from individual A, which means they all have the same DNA. And so this is a correct answer, but I always read all the questions and make sure of the answers and make sure that I'm not missing something. So cell 1 from individual A will have different banding pattern as compared to cell 3 from individual A. Cell 1 and cell 3 will have a, uh, from the same individual have different banding pattern. Again, not true because it's the same person. So the, all their DNA is completely identical in all their cells. So all the DNA in all your cells are the same. It's just you have certain genes turned on in one tissue versus another. There are exceptions to that, but for the most part, that's true. Cell 1 from individual A will have a different banding pattern compared to cell 4 from individual A. 1 and 4 will have different banding patterns. Again, same answer, not correct, because they're from the same individual. They have the same DNA. You have all the same DNA in every cell. I've said that many times in, during the year, so if you knew that, you wouldn't even have to know what gel electro electrophoresis is exactly but and you still don't have to the bottom line is you're just comparing patterns and if the pattern's the same 
because uh, because the DNA would be the same. And that's true of any one individual, but it's no other individual, unless this is their identical twin, they would not have the same pattern. All right, so here we have a red blood cell and it's placed in aqueous solution. Again, that means it's in wa it's a solution of water and some solute. Uh, the red blood cell has lower concentration of protein and sugar than the aqueous solution as is shown in the diagram and the diagram this uh, the volume of the cell is is equal volume as uh, to the outside so the volume outside and inside are the same and the solute concentration is lower right inside and the triangles are proteins and this and the little black circles are sugar so that's interesting we should what do we know right away let's think about what we know I said red so that's not the first thing I do when I'm solving a problem is I read the problem. I looked at the graph, looked uh, you know, uh, looked at diagram, and then I think about what do I know about this. I know things move from high to low uh, without any extra energy. If they are small and nonpolar, or rather small and not charged, well, both proteins and the last thing I know is that both proteins and sugar. need help to cross the membrane. Then the question is why? How do I know that? How do I know they need help, right? We've talked many times uh, the idea that proteins tend to be big. Well, proteins are big. Even the smallest protein is too big to go through the membrane, even if it's all made of nonpolar side chains, it's still too big. And sugar is too big. How do we know that? Remember diabetes. Diabetes happens because people need help to get sugar across the cell membrane. And so the way we we do that, the way we control that is this 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 protein called insulin which then has a signaling pathway that stimulates the uh, sugar channels. Remember uh, the remember that uh, membrane is uh, usually made of these phospholipids that don't allow things through, right? And when you're trying to get this this sugar molecule, when you're trying to get this sugar molecule across the membrane, you need some kind of channel. You need some kind of protein channel. Insulin controls that protein channel. Either it, it, it allows it to be in the membrane or not, depending on uh, whether there's insulin available. There's a signaling pathway. We talked about it in general. That channel, this is a channel protein. That allows sugar to come in. Without it can't come in otherwise because it's too big, sugar is too big, and it's it it's polar, so it's just too big. And proteins are too big as well. So now let's go ahead and knowing all that, let's look at the question. I don't even know if this has anything to do with the question. I only know that uh, I only know that this is the information that I learned in class. This is the information that I know that I read in the book that I did in my practice problems. So now let's look and see what the question is. Here's the question. Again, that's the setup here. And the question is what? What is most likely to occur? Water from the solution? Well, oh, that's one more thing that we should know. If, since the concentration is different, and the solutes can't pass through the membrane. We just identified that. 
unless somehow they tell us that they inserted a, a, a channel protein. The, the sugar and the protein are not getting through. In fact, we did this experiment with the dialysis bags in class where we put the dialysis bags with different sugar concentrations in, in, the, in the test tube and you looked and saw whether the, the bag got smaller or bigger. And you saw that uh, that was because that movement of that change in volume was because of osmosis. And osmosis remembers the diffusion of water. And it tells you in the problem that the solute is high in here. Uh, uh, solute is high outside and low inside. So therefore, the water must be, water must be the opposite, low outside, and water must be high inside. So that's one way to think of it. And if that's true, water is going to go from its high to its low. So water will move from inside to outside and the cell will shrink in this solution. If it were opposite, then the water would go into it. and it would. If, so the other way to think of this, as we talked about in class, uh, the other way to think of this, I'll use yellow, I guess, that this solution on the outside is hyper. Hypertonic and hypertonic solutions in hypertonic solutions cells shrink. They get smaller. The liquid, the water moves out. So water moves into hypertonic solutions. Hypertonic, again, to remind you, means high solute concentration. So then, what about if it were put into, what would a hypotonic solution, because I'm thinking to myself as I, as I go over this and reusing this to review for, the, for this test that's coming on Friday, I'm thinking to myself, hypotonic, they asked me in the practice, hypertonic, what if they gave me a problem with hypotonic? It would be a beaker, there'd be a cell in the center, uh, it would look something like this, and then there'd be couple out here, but there'd be a lot inside, so the outside is hypotonic. Same situation, no proteins can't pass through, so it's, hyp it's hypotonic. Where's the water going to go now? So hypotonic means low solute as compared to the inside of the cell. So there's high solute in here, which then suggests that with water, it must be high water. And inside, inside the cell must be low water. So even though water is going to move in both directions, we know most of the water must be going in and very little leaving. It's because you have high to low that would be the direction of the movement, so the, the cell will swell and possibly burst. That could happen, depending on how, 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 how hypertonic it is. So cells swell, get bigger, maybe even burst in hypotonic solutions, and cells shrink and get smaller in hypertonic solutions. So hypotonic versus hypertonic. And in ISO, they say the same. ISO by itself, isotonic actually means same. ISO means same. So hypotonic equals, so they have equal no change in volume, no movement of water, no net movement of water. Okay, so let's go ahead again, go back to reading the question, knowing all that, again, remembering all that stuff that flooded into our brains when we read the problem. So what happened when, what is most likely occur? Water from the solution will diffuse into the red blood cell. 
So this is again hypertonic. So water we expect to be it's leaving, not, not going into the red blood cell. So that would not be occurring at all. So that one's wrong. Water from the red blood cell will diffuse into the solution. Yeah, that's what we think would happen. We just said it. Definitely. Again, I'm going to read the rest of them. Protein and sugar from the solution will diffuse into the into the red blood cell. That would be incorrect because they're too big. Proteins and sugar are just too big to, to get into and out of the cell without help. Nowhere in here did they tell us we had channels for proteins or the or the sugar. Protein and sugar from the red blood cells will diffuse into the solution. Again, not possible because we discussed they're too big. So this is a really good question. A question like this I'd expect to see on the end of course exam because they're testing your understanding of isotonic, hyper, hypotonic, and hypertonic, which we've done many a practice problem. So if you've been reviewing and you've been uh, and you've watched these videos and you're more prepared for Friday than you were today. Here's our friend the cladogram. And it says evolutionary relations among the uh, the four animals uh, and traits are shown in the cladogram. So let's see, we have vertebrate, and out here we could have an outgroup. What outgroup could you pick that didn't have a vertebrate? Perhaps you might choose a snail. A uh, snail doesn't have a, a backbone. It's an invertebrate by definition. Does not have a vertebrate. So somehow somewhere along the line, of evolution, the organism, some common ancestor developed a vertebrate, and Sharks were among them, or some uh, some common answer between shark and the rest of these was among them. Some of the individuals that lived back then had developed two pairs of limbs, not sharks though. So sharks were left behind, and they stayed. They developed in a different direction, and they became sharks. Uh, but some common ancestor between bullfrogs and kangaroos and chimpanzees had two pairs of limbs. That individual did not have mammary glands. Remember, anything to the right, these hash marks, these traits, these, these individuals don't have these traits. So bullfrogs don't have mammary glands. They don't produce milk. You can't milk a frog, for instance. So that's mammary glands. And then, of course, chimpanzees and kangaroos do. But kangaroos don't have placenta, where a chimpanzee does. So kangaroos have pouches where they develop their babies, where we develop our babies inside ourselves, and so do chimpanzees. So placenta was a trait that developed then after that. So we move on and we look at, at this. Let me go ahead and paste this. Oops. Let me look at the question. Select the boxes and identify the traits that each animal possess. This seems like an easier question. So there's a bullfrog. There's a bullfrog. Bullfrog has two pairs of limbs and vertebrate. Bullfrog, does it have a placenta? If a bullfrog has a placenta, it's like possible to identify each trait. So you would choose, I, su I suppose, you would have to choose, I, I, I guess there would be a clicking inv involved here, but I, I would, does a, placenta, does a bullfrog have a placenta? Absolutely not. So you would not choose A for sure. Uh, does a bullfrog have a vertebrate? Sure does. So you'd have to you'd have to choose E for sure. Yes. Let me circle them with a green. So yes, I would choose E. Does a bullfrog have a mammary gland? No. Does a full bullfrog have two pairs of limbs? Yes, it does. Bullfrogs have both two pairs of limbs and vertebrates. It's on this side of the chart. Remember, the things are evolving from left to right. This snail doesn't have any of these characters. Chimpanzees should have all four of the characters, right? So chimpanzees is the only one on the chart that has all four, the placenta, the vertebrate, the mammary gland, and the two pairs of limbs. Notice that they put these out of order. They're not in the same order as they are on the chart. It's their way of, of testing your reading ability, I suppose. Kangaroo, kangaroo has three of the four. It, has, it, it doesn't have placenta. It has a vertebrate. A vertebra, it has mammary glands, it has two pairs of limbs. And a shark, a shark only has one of the characters, and that's a vertebra. So as you can see, uh, the you know, one question might be you might ask yourself is which which two are most closely related, the kangaroo and the chimpanzee, would be most closely related since the only difference is this 
one character, the placenta. And in fact, they're both mammals. Where uh, the bullfrog is more is more closely related to uh, chimpanzee and kangaroos than a shark because it has that two pairs of limbs that all three groups share. Where this clade, the shark, is the one that fur that's furthest away from us and uh, evolutionarily, we have the most common recent ancestors going to be between kangaroo and chimpanzee. Those are the kinds of questions you can read off a chart like this. Again, the cladogram.